feet, everybody, for the spokesman for the King of Glory, Pastor Ben McBride, as he's coming to preach the Word of God. Amen. Man, I tried to say amen in a water bottle. That didn't. I don't got that much power, so I say amen. <laughs> now, that would have been a miracle. Now, if you. Amen. Good to be back in the house uh, with all of us and, and good to see uh, all of our faces and very much so if I'm not here, it's normally because I'm around trying to preach that good news of freedom that we all believe that God is uh, bringing forward into all our lives. So I don't want to uh, belabor the point. Um, let's uh, bow your heads with me and let's take a moment of prayer. Lord, we just want to say thank you. Because if it had not been for you who was on our side, Lord, we would have been swallowed up by our enemies. But Lord, we are thankful, Lord, for you, Lord, who has swallowed up death. You swallowed up the grave. You swallowed up the power of our enemy to destroy us. And because of that, we have life. And we have the ability to keep on pushing forward even when life at times tries to push us down. So today, Lord, we gather and to worship as we've been doing and even as a time, Lord, to listen to your words, Lord. My prayer is that uh, you would remove my own thoughts and cause uh, your words to come through uh, my thoughts and words that we've written down. Lord, cause our hearts and our minds to be awakened by your spirit to be energized by your spirit. Help us to receive some courage and boldness to keep on moving forward in our own lives and finding ways to give our lives for one another as we stay working with you for you making all things new. Lord, we just say thank you. We say it in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. amen. Come on, say amen again. Amen. amen. Let me just drink some water if that's all right with y'all. Hey man, how many love Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> Some of y'all still thinking about it. Hey man, that's all right. We want to come to church to think about it. Some of y'all was like, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, let's see how you do in 25, 30 minutes. We'll see how I feel. Hey man, we're just glad to be back uh, in the house. And today I'm going to be talking about this title, Reclaim Jesus. Look at the person next to you and say, Reclaim Jesus. Look at the person on the other side and say, reclaim Jesus. Look at the person behind you and say, reclaim. That don't work. That don't work. <laughs> it doesn't work, but I've done it a hundred times, and I've even done it five times here, amen, and we still go for it. That's all right. Amen. Reclaim <laughs> Jesus. With all that's going on, there's a critique by some across Facebook, which you know is the main platform that we do all of our debate on now. How can you follow Jesus considering what other so-called Christians are doing or have historically done? Yes, the name of Jesus has been used to do many hellish things on this planet. Genocide, slavery, colonization, rape, mistreatment, homophobia, xenophobia, discrimination, even now, we just had a week of television where people who claim to love Jesus seem to really love the Romans. If you were to take their rhetoric and overlay it on the gospel's historical backdrop. In freedom movements, some critique that following Jesus is complicity with oppressive systems. Many are correct in making these assumptions if you were to, to define Jesus by some of the people who say they follow him. But that's why today I want us to reclaim Jesus. Look at the person that you say, reclaim Jesus. We want to reclaim him today as the consistent light, power, and strength that gives us agency to keep joining God's freedom train. We're going to start with our opening scripture, Psalm uh, 27, and I'm going to read. It's going to be up here on the screen for you. I'm going to read it out of the King James Version. I know we all like to read all of our new versions, and I love those, but there's nothing like reading the Psalms from that old Shakespearean King James English. Hey, Amen. It, it just does something to you. I don't know. I don't know whether... Well, I know King James didn't have too much of the spirit with him, but at least it sounds good, right? Touch the person next to you say it sounds good. So I'm going to read Psalm 27 for us in the King James Version. It says, the Lord is my light 
and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear. O oh Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Just a hand for the words of God. Amen. Everyone say, reclaim Jesus. The first thing I think as we reclaim Jesus is we first have to reclaim Jesus as the light. Embracing this is critical because of dim times that life brings. You see, when shadows are overwhelming us and life seems less illuminated, uh, we have a form of life that's been given to us through the life of Jesus that we are called to uh, exemplify and that we are called to follow. You see, we are called to walk a path, uh, paths that include danger and risk, but also paths that include blessing and celebration. Now, it's it's pretty easy to praise God and walk the paths of blessing and celebration. We all like those paths. Uh, if we could, we'd buy t-shirts with blessing and celebration all on them. But it's very different when we have to walk uh, the paths of challenges. The paths of danger that hit us all the way to the core. We have to recognize Jesus as a light because when we are walking along a path that is less illuminated, uh, we have choices as to how we are going to choose how we see. What are the tools and the mechanisms that we're going to grab, hold on, that we're going to try to find a way to see? When we're in these dark, challenging, dimly lit places, we must ensure that we don't grab the lamps of empire or the lamps of our own cultural humanity or the lamps of the ways that we were brought up or the lamps of the ways that we want to get down or the lamps that come out of our anger, but we must make sure we hold on to the lamp of God, which is Jesus the light. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says, there is a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all the laughter will end in heartbreak. 
You see, the way of Jesus and the life of Jesus was given to us for an example of a light. John the writer shows us in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, he shows us Jesus as the light for all humanity. And John points out that even though Jesus shows up among his people as the light, the people living in a dim generation could not recognize Jesus as the light. You do know that although Jesus is the light, if you fail to recognize Jesus as the light, your pathway will still be dim. One thing I love about Jesus, Jesus is not a spiritual rapist. He does not force an expression or an act of love upon you because he has the power to. But Jesus' love and Jesus' light is one that we are invited into. He shows up among an oppressed people and yet they did not have the capacity to see and experience that life and that light. The life that Jesus shows us in first century Palestine is a life of courage to resist the governing council of his day by reinterpreting their laws and how they should be applied. Jesus shows us a life of discernment that can recognize the spark of the divine in a Roman soldier's faith while still declaring that the Roman world is on its way to hell. Jesus' life is a life of mercy to stand between the patriarchal rule of law that tried to execute a woman who was caught in the middle of a mistake. And Jesus' life is a life that shows us a way of being able to feed the poor when you yourself are impoverished. Jesus' life is a life that pushes back on the scarcity of me and embraces the abundance of us. Jesus' life is a life that prays for the spirit of the executioner while comfort the mother who's lost the son. Jesus' life is a life that trusts resurrection lying at the end of our despair. Jesus' life is a life that always says that empire never has the last say. Jesus' life is our light. For the Jesus follower, his life isn't a light, it is the light. Look at the person next to you and say, He's not a light. Look at him again and say, he is the light. The light, it's not our option for those of us who follow Jesus, whether we want to live like Jesus. We must live like Jesus, even during the times when we don't want to live like Jesus the most. I, I know y'all all sanctified and you, you were born swimming around in your mother's belly in baptismal waters and you sneeze out anointing oil, but for the rest of us that are less spiritual, there are times where I don't want to be like Jesus. There's some times I want to be like some other people. Whew. There's some times I want to be like Doughboy from Boys in the Hood. You know? I forgot we're on the live stream. Huh? Let me leave that alone. There's some times where anger and revenge and pain fills your heart. And you don't want to be like Jesus when you get in the dim areas when people have failed you and relationships are breaking down. Your family feels like it's falling apart. The folks on your job aren't acting right. The people at the school are letting you down. You don't want to be like Jesus. But it's during those times that we must ensure that we allow Jesus to be the light that illuminates our pathway so that we can see the way which God wants us to walk. Have you ever walked around in the dark room without a light? It's easier to walk around uh, in, a, in a dark room without a light when you have been in that room before. Because you kind of know where things are supposed to be. So you kind of walk around feeling around and looking for things you can recognize and, and things that you know are there and you already know in your mind what will hurt you in that room. So you're kind of walking to avoid those things. But what do you do when you're in a room you've never been in before? When you actually don't know what to look for. When you don't know what to try to avoid. I was walking one time uh, in a room, had got to this new office space, and I was walking around, and, and I stubbed my toe on the end of a desk that I didn't know was there. Now, you would have thought my big 300-pound self got run over by a truck, because when I hit my toe on that desk, my whole body crumbled. I just, ow! Oh! <laughs> 
that, that pain shot from my toe all the way up through my body, through the top of my head, hit the ceiling, came back, went out through my ears, bounced off the wall, came back in, and shot back down to my toe all in one second. And in that moment, for some reason, I didn't want to say the name Jesus. You ever know, you ever know this? <laughs> Not y'all, y'all very spiritual people here at the way, right? But why is it that when you hurt yourself, you always want to say a bad word? Just keep it real, right? Why is it that that come out in you? You know, my dad is the only person I know that when he bumps his toe, he goes, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's a true story, that's a true story. Right? Well, I think he trained himself because I think for 30 years before he was saying something else. Amen, right? But when you hit your foot, you know, you want to say something. See, that's what happens when we're walking around in a less illuminated place and we're injuring ourselves. It has a tendency to bring out of us that which we don't want. And that's why we need Jesus to be the light in our lives that allows us to make sure that we see where we are. That Jesus' life shows us how it is that we need to be and how it is that we need to be showing up in the place of pain and in the place of challenge. We also need to recognize that Jesus is our saving power. The psalm that I read in the beginning, this psalm is written by David, a Hebrew, uh, most likely just arriving to the throne as he became the king of uh, Israel or at the end of his rule. Either way, we must imagine how he felt reflecting upon his life. As David had uh, been going through many things, overlooked as a teenager by the leaders of his family. He defeated the greatest symbol of violence that was facing his nation and ended up hunted by his own nation's president. David's life, he failed in his personal life. He was a terrible spouse a few times over. He struggled as a parent. He betrayed a close friend. And he almost self-destructed a few times. But he continued to discover that God was his saving power. In the life of Jesus' early followers, we find that they articulate saving power belonging in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4 says salvation comes no other way, for no other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved, only this one. Somebody say Jesus. I want you to know that the scriptures and the early followers of Jesus tell us that our saving power is found in the name of Jesus. It's found in the life of Jesus. It's found in the example of Jesus. We're going to fail in this life. We're going to have to ride the ups and the downs. But when we find ourselves being overwhelmed, our hope is that Jesus, through the saving power of God, will bring us through whatever life has in front of us. I'm here to tell you today that God will deliver you and God will deliver us. And this is why we fight for freedom. You see, we fight for freedom for one another and we fight for freedom in our life because God is and has always been about the liberation of the oppressed. God has been and will always be on the side of the marginalized. God is about that life. I'm so glad I'll serve no sucker God. I'm glad I don't serve no, no, no scared God. I'm glad I don't serve no weak God. I'm glad I don't serve no little go hide behind the pulpit God. But our God is about that life of freedom. Our God is a God about that life of justice. Our God is a God about that life of power. So whatever you face in your life, you need to recognize your God is about that life. Look at the person next to you and say, he's about that life. Tell them God's about that life. The next time you sitting in your living room looking at these fools on the TV, look at that TV and say, God is about that life. The next time you deal with some of these racist, crazy folks in this world, look at them and say, my God is about that life. The next time you stand against a state power that says it's going to destroy you, recognize inside your body, my God is about that life. 
And that's why the scripture says in Isaiah 54 that no weapon that's formed against you will be able to prosper because our God is about that life. I'm so glad that God is about deliverance because there are some times that I realize I need a savior, but there are other times that a savior knows I need saving. Aren't you so glad for the times when you need to be saved and you don't know you need to be saved? Whoo! I know y'all real spiritual people, but there's times where I need God to know I need to be saved. Sometimes I'm in the middle of a situation and my soul is crying out, I want to be saved, you know. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> that God knows I need saving. The reason you can press for freedom is because God is pressing through us for freedom. God is pressing around us for freedom. God is pressed before us for freedom. And God will be pressing after us for freedom. God's power is about bringing freedom in our life, not just against the systems of this world, but God wants to bring freedom in your spirit from the darkness that comes from the enemy. God wants to set your heart free from the temptations of this world. God wants to set your heart free from the shackles of this reality. And God wants your heart to be a heart that is free to praise, a heart that's free to love, a heart that's free to trust, a heart Heart that's free to act for the ways that God is bringing. And this is why we can go on the freeway and disrupt the status quo. Because how many know that God through Jesus always disrupted the status quo? When Jesus shows up as a deliverer, it meant the status quo of Rome was disrupted. It meant that the aristocratic Jews who were comfortable with their life in the Roman Empire were disrupted. When Jesus shows up, the power of God is always about disrupting the status quo and bringing in the way of freedom that God wants to bring into the world. After 400 years of silence in the life of Jesus, in the life of the Jews, we have Jesus showing up in the womb of a 13 or 14 year old woman named Mary living in a patriarchal society, but God shows up in her womb as Jesus to shut down the systems of empire, to shut down the systems of the enemy, to shut down the systems of the devil. And you need to recognize that if you want to be a part of reclaiming Jesus and being a part of Jesus' movement, you're going to have to be willing to let God shut some stuff down inside your heart and then use you to shut some things down in this world. Somebody say shut it down. Oh, y'all little lethargic crowd in here. Somebody say shut it down. I'm going to go back outside and find me some real protesters. Somebody shout shut it down. Oh, now that, that's like it, right? See, when Jesus shows up going uh, to the, uh, when, when he shows up going to the, to the, uh, uh, the temple courts, you see, Jesus shows up the way we read the scriptures. This is why we got to reclaim Jesus is sometimes we read the scriptures through the lens of white supremacy. I don't got a lot of time to unpack that, but uh, let, me, let me just do a little quick 60 second unpacking and y'all got the good Reverend Dr. Michael McBride, the, the doctor of all live free theologies and ideologies, amen, and he'll unpack that a little bit more through some 10 week groups, right? But let me give you a quick version. We sometimes read the way uh, the oppressor wanted us to see Jesus that Jesus came inside the temple and he was just so upset with what was happening. So he kicked over a couple tables and he told some people, you guys should stop acting like this because my father's house is a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves and it's not right. Y'all seen the little pictures. He's got a little belt, right? And he's standing there with a bathrobe with a little perm. And he's always posed like Usain Bolt. You know? But how many know when Jesus showed up to the temple courts, 
and he saw that there was one system for the Jews where they were able to come in and worship God. It was called the court of the Jews, the temple courts, and they could come in and worship God before the poor and the Gentiles who wanted to worship this God. They created another area called the Gentile court where the people had to come in and pay money to be able to worship a God who wanted to be worshiped in spirit and truth. And when Jesus, even though he could, go into the other court. Yes, sir. Oh, I wish y'all was with me in here. Even though he could go through the court of the Jews, he chose to go through the court of the Gentiles. And when he came in and he saw the system that was illegal and a system that was unjust, Jesus shut it down. Somebody shout, shut it down. Somebody shout, shut it down. Jesus came in that temple and he kicked over every table and he threw them jokers out. And I could imagine back in Palestine, some folks got on papyrus book. And they started putting their status, I cannot believe Jesus the Nazarene. He came inside the temple. He didn't even belong in that temple. That's not even his temple. He's supposed to be on the other side. And he came in and he messed up all those things and he shut down that court. And does he recognize that some of those people who are selling doves and some of those people who are selling lambs have worked really hard? Does he recognize that there were families back in Nazareth and Jericho that needed the money from those systems? Does Jesus recognize that he disrupted and that there there were chariots that needed to come through that court that had sick people. Does he recognize that there were things that needed to happen? But Jesus said, I'm here to shut it down. Somebody say, reclaim Jesus. Say, reclaim Jesus. You see, when white supremacy gets us to accept a version of Jesus that's false, then we start living a life that's false. But when we understand that Jesus is never on the side of oppression, but he's always on the side of the oppressor, of the those who are oppressed, that Jesus is always aligning himself with those who are most marginalized. That Jesus doesn't sit in the middle of oppressed Hebrews and tweet Roman soldiers' lives matter. Some of y'all will get that when you get home. It's all right. I'm not here to make friends because I recognize as a part of the Jesus tradition, our life is not about making friends. Our life is not about saying what other people want to hear. But we are a part of being a prophetic people, of being a radical people, of being a courageous people because we recognize Jesus is our power. Now, the reality of that is that even though Jesus is our power, how many know that following Jesus still is going to bring you into risky, vulnerable situations? Not just in the streets and in the freedom movement, but even in your own life, that forgiving folks who've hurt you, trusting people who have betrayed you, creating margin in your life for people you don't like having grace for people who are yet not far enough in the journey who are still spewing things out of their mouth that are destructive to your person how many know that we can shout all of our rhetoric about Jesus being power but how many know that sometimes still living through the pain of the reality of this world impacts you on very deep heavy ways and the reason I love Jesus being the power is because I also recognize that Jesus is our strength. This is what David talks about in Psalm 27, that the Lord is our light and he is our salvation, our saving power, and that he is the strength of our life. It is Jesus that we lean on because although God is our saving power, we still feel all the impacts of this broken world. Anxiety hits us 
We ask ourselves, will I survive this system of white supremacy? It's not just for people of color, because how many know white supremacy kills white people too? Sometimes you just don't know it. But it's a system that's killing us all. Uh, will I survive a career change? Will I make it out of school? Will this cancer go into remission? All these realities of life. But I believe, beloved, that this is where God wants to be sustenance for us. That fuels our resistance of fear. As David writes in the psalm, when you feel the pain of the wicked, it's going to be God that causes them to fall. When people try to hang up on you, it's going to be the Lord that strengthens your ability to not surrender your faith. When an all-out assault is coming against you, the confidence that we will win, the confidence that Black Lives Matter only comes from the strength of God that exists deep down inside our hearts. As Dr. King talked about our confidence that the moral arc of the universe is long bending towards justice, we only can believe that because of the one who we know can bend the arc. The strength of God living in our lives to comfort us, to bring us forward during times of great challenge. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8, I love it where it says, we've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do. But we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Jesus is the strength of our life. Jesus is the one who lives inside of us and gives us the ability to go through hard trials and challenges and not give up. A lot of folks saw the demonstration, the action that we did, when was that, a few weeks ago or something like that? after Brother Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were murdered right there in front of our eyes. It's very interesting. I was sharing with some folks uh, earlier. Y'all know I believe in keeping it real, right? How many keep it 100 Christians? All right. I believe in keeping it 100, right? Not 100. 100. Everybody say 100. Don't you just feel more urban right there? You just, some of y'all ethnic card was, was about to expire. Everybody say 100. You now renewed. Amen. You now renewed. <laughs> and, and so as, as the night that after the 24 hours when we saw Brother Philando <clears throat> murdered, I was sitting at my counter and I wrote a poem because I just was, my heart was just so out of energy. And, and one of the tweets that I started tweeting, a lot of folks were tweeting, I just said, I'm, I'm out of hashtags. I just say, I, I can't keep doing this no more. This, I, just, I can't keep trying to go on with this thing. And I, I felt in my heart, the spirit, uh, in my heart to, to call an action for the next day. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe a couple hundred people show up and we're, we're going to go down to the police station and, and we're going we're gonna to march and we're going we're gonna to speak back against this empire that keeps destroying our lives. And within 24 hours, we had 3,000 people signed up for the action. Now, here's the thing, because people think, oh, you know, you're a great organizer. I was scared out of my mind. We got out there. I'm standing there with a couple of other clergy leaders. And he said, Ben, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know what we're going to do, man. I only, I only expected 300 people to come out here. Let's, there's people for as far as we could see. And in any case, we had to keep pausing during the whole action, and praying, yeah. and asking God, Lord, what do we do? Yeah. What's the next move that we make? We had one action plan, but because the police didn't do what we needed for the action to be planned, we, we were standing there, and one of the uh, sisters looked at me, and she said, Ben, which was one of our uh, other action plans, said, do you want to take the freeway? I said, well, let's pause. Give me a couple minutes, because I want to pray. Yeah. And I want to ask God, is that what we're supposed to do? 
because I don't want my ego or our ego to lead us in the wrong direction unless we feel the spirit is pushing us on what we need to do. And after a couple minutes, I felt impressed. Let's take the freeway. So as we took the freeway, and a couple hours later, we left. Some other people stayed on the freeway, and we pulled force off on the action. I'm talking about God being the strength of our life, because then within the next few days, after these actions, I was supposed to speak at a church, and the church began to get hate mail and messages. How dare you let this nigger come preach at your church on Sunday? You're a nigger loving church. The church I was at was a multiracial church. I began to get flooded with hate messages and hate speech, feeling threats coming through police departments and city governments. One of my contacts from inside their department said the police chief was banging on the table saying, I want Ben McBride. We want to put him in jail. We want to arrest him. And in that moment, see, we, we all, you know, sometimes y'all see myself, you see Pastor Mike and, or, or others, y'all see one another, and we look at one another, and we feel like all of us always got it all together. Yeah. That we're all invincible to the threats. Yeah. We're invincible to the pain. All inside me, I was breaking down. Feeling the threat of the empire, saying, I'm coming to get you. Yeah. I'm coming to take your body. I'm coming to, to grab you. And in that moment, I felt so vulnerable and so weak. But what God revealed to me in this moment, and this is where this sermon comes out of, is that God must be the strength of our life. That there are some moments that life is going to bring you in that nice words can't do nothing for you. There's some moments when you are facing the critique of others, when you're facing the critique of people who used to be your friends. There are moments where people who said they were your friends and abandoned you. There are moments when it's not politically expedient for people to stand with you, that God must be the strength of your life. Reclaiming Jesus is not just about us recognizing God as the light to illuminate our way and the power to give us the ability to resist the enemy, but it's also recognizing that God must be the strength of our life when times when we feel so vulnerable and we feel like giving up and we are afraid and we are overwhelmed and we feel like we can't go on another day, that that's when we must lean back into the arms of God. That's when we must allow the spirit to renew us that's when we must allow the grace of God and the mercy of God to find us when you're in the middle of the pain in the middle of the challenge in the middle of the frustration somebody say God is my strength somebody say God is my strength come on say God is my strength Wherever you might be today in your life, you might feel like I don't even have margin to care about freedom for somebody else or margin to think about the system because you feel so oppressed or so challenged in your own life. But I'm here to tell you that God wants to be the strength of your life. So you have the capacity to withstand what the enemy brings against you because as the scripture says we are more than a conqueror through the one who loved us so I want to encourage some of us today as we reclaim Jesus that it is necessary for us to reclaim Jesus this prophetic radical Jesus that wants to exist as the strength of our life so that we can operate through the power of his spirit to have his life illuminating our path so we can walk the walk to be a part of God's freedom transforming movement in this world. Stand on your feet with me. David says in verse 4 of Psalm 27, he said, one thing have I desired from the Lord 
and that will I seek after. This is important. David says, this is what I'm going to seek after. This is what I'm going to desire. He says one thing. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Dwelling in the house of the Lord is not about dwelling at the way. Although a part of being in the presence of God is about connecting with other believers and being in spaces where we can worship together, be discipled, learn how to follow Jesus, learn how to support one another. But I want to lift up for you that dwelling in the house of the Lord is to think about how do you regard this as to what you're facing in your life? Build a house of the Lord wherever you are through God's light, God's power, and God's strength. What would it look like when the, in the challenges of your own living room that instead of cussing him out or cussing her out, or instead of giving in to how you feel overwhelmed, what would it look like if you begin to call for God's light, God's power, and God's strength? What would it look like if when you're at your job and you just feel like these people are just being complicit in driving you crazy? That instead of taking up the weapons of their warfare, you declare God's light, God's power, and God's strength. What would it look like if in your marriage, in relationship with the people that you have at school, in college, in high school, in middle school, what would it look like if you begin to pray and say, Lord, be a light, be power, be strength? Because I want to be like you, Jesus. I know I can be like myself, I can be like others. But I want to be like you. Friends, we got to reclaim Jesus. Let's not allow this world to turn us into caricatures of itself. Let's refuse to be tools of the empire. Let's refuse to fight fire with fire. Because the last time I looked at some firefighters, except from some very small scenarios, you don't put out fire with fire. You put out fire with water. And may the water of the Spirit of God be flowing through us to put out the fires in our own lives and the fires in our world. 